Lord. Praise the Lord. Can you celebrate with me, my father, your father? The set man over the house. Let's appreciate Pastor Bolaji. We can do better than that. Hallelujah. You may please be seated. Thank you so much. All right. We're going to be moving with the speed of light. Are we ready? Hallelujah. Let's open our Bibles to 1 John chapter 3, verse 16. And we're going to be reading to verse 17. Hallelujah. Scripture says, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Verse 17. It says, But whosoever hath this world's goods, and seeth his bro brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him. It says, How dwelleth the love of God in him? Praise the name of the Lord. You see, John wrote first, first um, John chapter 3 verse 16 and coincidentally he was the same person that wrote John 3 16 now John 3 16 is a very popular verse it says for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but what have everlasting life now first John 3 16 seems like a continuous or a continuum of John 3 16 it says now that we know that Jesus died for us it says what should be our response he says our response is that we love our brother it says, how can you shut up your bowels of compassion towards somebody that you know has need and you have the means to help that person? It says, how can you say that you truly have the love of God in you? How can you say that you have received the love of God if you cannot love your brother or your sister? Praise the name of the Lord. We need to understand God's love towards us. What God really did on Easter. What was the death for? What was the suffering for? You know, you need to understand because sometimes you can think about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and think about it like a movie. Have you ever wa watched a movie and it seems so real that it took you, uh, especially um, all these um, horror or scary movies. Ah, I hate horror. I, 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 I can't. I can't even stand it. Hey, oh God, oh God, oh God. But somewhere in your mind, you realize that it's not real. It's make-believe. It's not real. As, especially when you're watching the film for the second time. Your hypertension comes down. Praise the name of the Lord. Do you understand? But Jesus Christ's suffering and death was real. It wasn't make-believe. He actually suffered. In fact, by, historians say that when Jesus Christ was being scourged, praise the name of the Lord, he wasn't beaten or flogged. He was scourged. He was scourged not by secondary school teachers. Turn your back. Turn your back. No, no, no. You are turn now. Turn. You don't. Yeah. You don't know. You know those teachers are supposed to give you twelve strokes, but they give you twenty-one by arranging you. You know those kind of teachers. It wasn't those kind of teachers. These guys were trained to interrogate. They were trained centurions. They were, a, they were masters at their craft. So, historians say that the whip that they used for Jesus was whips that had dumbbells, heavy metal, and had spikes coming out of it. Such that when they hit him and the thing goes round, the dumbbells will hit his bones and his flesh and make it soft and tender. So that when they are recoiling the whip, it's tearing the flesh. And they didn't just go one stroke. They went several stripes. That's why the Bible says, by his stripes, we are healed. Isaiah 53 3 says that he bore those stripes because of you and I. It was a punishment for our sins. Glory to God. The Bible calls him in Isaiah, the man of sorrow. Glory to God. He took all those things for our sake. He didn't do them, hey, glory to God. He didn't do them just because, okay, he just felt like suffering. No, those, that was the punishment that was supposed to come upon us. But that punishment, he took it on behalf of us. I'll give you a little story to illustrate that a bit further. There, was, there were twin brothers in a particular town or country or kingdom. And they were, um, they were princes, right? And their father was the king of that kingdom. So there was the good one because they were identical twins. So the good one, there was a good twin that everybody liked in the kingdom. 
he was always blessing people. He was always nice to people. He was always visiting people. People liked him. But there was the other one that was arrogant, narcissistic, obnoxious. He didn't like people. He treated people anyhow. Would take things from people forcefully. So the people of that kingdom didn't like him. One day, he went and harassed a man, you know, and beat the man until the man died. So the people of the kingdom were angry. They were, they were like, this, is, this has got to end. They now went after him and they were going to kill him. But the guy had enough sense to run to daddy because he knew that daddy was going to do something about it. So he ran all the way to the king's palace and fell before the king. And the king knew that, wow, well, I need to save my son. He now said, he now appeased the people and said, you know what? If any other person kills anybody, kill someone in this town, he will have instant death. There will be no need for judgment. He will die on the spot. And the people of the kingdom said, okay, that's fine. We will not kill him. He was doing that in the bit to save the son. But he had, he had, he had um, spoken a law that was general to all. So the guy was happy. He went back out again and went on his atrocity, on his rampage and killed another person. This time he couldn't go to daddy because daddy's word is law. So they didn't even need to take him to the king. They were going to meet, meet justice that day. Do you understand what I'm saying? They are going to enact justice. So they went after him. He couldn't run to daddy anymore. He was just running up and down. All of a sudden, he saw his other brother in a distance. And the brother saw him and saw the crowd, the mob running behind him. They entered the room together. They were wearing different clothes, but they looked identical. So the brother said, what did you do? He said, I've killed the gay. He said, you, why are you doing this? He said, you know what? Bring your clothes. I will wear them. Take my own clothes. He said, see, I've lived a good life. This is an opportunity for you to live a good life. So the good brother, wearing his brother's, the bad brother's clothes, went out into the mob and the mob killed him. That's what Jesus did for us. The Bible says, he knew no sin, yet became sin for us. He that knew no sin became sin for us. He took our place. And what is better than that is that we might think that Jesus just died for us. It's much better than that. He didn't just die for us. He died as us. You don't understand what I'm saying. That other brother, he was the bad brother, but when anybody saw him, they thought he was the good brother. So in their mind, the bad brother had died. That's how Jesus is. So when you walk, you don't walk as Kami, you walk as Christ. That's the Bible says, if any man beware, in Christ, hallelujah, you are clothed with Christ. That's why when you go to God in prayer, God does not see you. He sees Christ. Hallelujah. That's why your prayers can never be denied. Because when Christ was walking on the earth, he said, Father, I thank you because you hear me always. Now, when you go before God, he doesn't see you. He sees Christ and he hears you when? Always. Glory to God. Christ died as us. He identified with us. He came as a man. And some people might say, what's the big deal in that? Is he not God? He came as a man. Eh, now, angels too appear. You don't know. It's a big deal. You see, if you know who God is, you understand that his incarnation was a big deal. God, the Bible describes him as the invisible God that dwelleth in unapproachable lights. Invisible God that dwelleth in unapproachable light. Let me explain what that means. How many of us have played video games? You, you played maybe soccer, Mortal Kombat, Tekken. You play video games. When you play those video games, you are the one controlling the characters and they are hitting each other and the characters are just going, feeling the punches and everything. Guess what? You, the controller, you don't feel their punches. You don't get hit by character or when you're playing football, you fall down and you fall down in, in, in this real life. You don't feel anything. You cannot identify with the pain of the character. In fact, you might even be laughing. Why? Because you don't feel the pain. The pain does not translate from the game to you. Just think about God. God created the heavens and the earth. All the phenomena of the universe, the laws of the universe, God is outside those things. He cannot be touched by it. You understand what I'm saying? God created time so he cannot be in time. Time is in him. That's why God can exist both past, present, and future at the same time. Because all of eternity is in God. Glory to God. That's why the Bible says he has placed an eternity in our hearts. 
Glory to God. So, he now decides. Because, see, God is an invisible God outside of time. He now says, I want to relate with man. So, for me to relate with man, I must become a visible God in time. That's Jesus. Jesus is the visible God in time. So, Jesus came. Why did he do that? So that he can identify with our pain. That's why you see things like Jesus wept. Jesus hungered. He hung on the cross and he said, I thirst. That's why Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15 says that we do not have a high priest. Cannot be, that cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. That means our weaknesses, our limitations. He can, he can be touched but he understands. He says, so therefore, come boldly into his throne of grace and ask for what? Mercy and grace at the hour of need. Because you now have a priest that understands you. You now have a God that feels what you feel. When you are hungry, he understands. When you've not had a child, maybe you've been married for 5-15 years and you're going through all the emotions, he understands. Glory to God. So, he's not just a vending machine. He's an emotional God that knows how you feel. He doesn't just see what you feel. He empathizes and feels what you feel. This is why he came, to identify with us. Another reason why he came to identify with us is to take away the curse. Galatians 3.13. It says, curse is any man that hung, hangs on a tree so that the blessing of Abraham might come upon us. So he took upon him the curse of sin. Praise the name of the Lord. We need to understand that sin was a problem. As a matter of fact, there will be no death without sin. Bible says because of one man's disobedience, sin and de- a de- sin has come on uh, come to the earth, and death had passed to all men. Glory to God. So Jesus Christ came and became a body of sin to deal with sin. That's why in um, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 55. Let's just look at that quickly. 1 Corinthians 15, 55. We'll read 55 and 56. So this is the writer saying, Oh death. Where is thy sting? It says, Oh grave, where is thy victory? Verse 56. It now says, The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. So, what he's saying is that death, where is your power? Why? Because somebody had risen from the dead. Somebody had defeated sin on the cross. So he said, we don't need to fear death anymore. Hallelujah. You see, one of the things that Jesus did was not just to identify with our weaknesses, was also to bring us into his strength and his divinity. Glory to God. I love the way Pastor Bolaji said it in, at the NLP conference. He said, the cross represents, when Jesus was on the cross, represents a number of things. Number one is that before Jesus, there were two kinds of people. When God looked at the earth, he saw two kinds of people, the Jews and the Gentiles. So there was a middle wall of partition. The Jews were God's own people. The Gentiles were not God's people. And if you, don't, if you didn't know today, now you know, we're all Gentiles. Hallelujah. So if Jesus did not come, or you're like, wow. You know, but Jesus came, and when he came, he did two things. Number one, he broke down the wall of partition. On the cross, on one side was the Jews, and on another side was the Gentiles. And on one, on, going up was divinity. Going down, touching the earth was what? Was humanity. Bible says he brought everything together in one body. <laughs> Glory to God. That's why the Bible says there is neither Jew, nor Gentile, nor Greek. It says all of us are one and the same in Christ. Glory to God. That's what he did. So even though you feel pain, you now have the power to overcome pain. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You now have this divine nature. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. It's so important. You need to think about this. That's why, see, nothing can harass you again. What is that mountain before Zerubbabel? What is that mountain? He said, you shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea. And if you not doubt in your heart, but believe that the things you say shall come to pass, you shall have whatsoever you say. Why? He says, have the faith of God. This is the same way the faith of God works. As he is, so are we in this world. Glory to God. He says, I've given you authority 
over serpents and scorpions to tread, to command demons to go. Because as he commanded demons, you can now command demons. Because you have his divinity even in your humanity. Glory to God. You see, the biggest thing about being a Christian is not going to heaven. Many Christians don't know. Heaven is not a reward. Heaven is a temporary home at best. The biggest thing about Christianity is the spirit of God in your human spirit. You have the life of God in you. It's called Zoe. It's called Zoe. Eternal life of God. What does that mean? It means you can do what God can do. Glory to God. He says, if the spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead dwells in your mortal body, it will do what? It will vitalize you. That's why sickness cannot live in your body. How can the Holy Ghost be there and sickness be there? How can the Holy Ghost be in you and cancer be there? How can the Holy Ghost be in you and tumors be in your body? It's not possible. When you understand this, you understand your divine nature. Just think about this way. Can Jesus be sick? Can he have cancer? Can he be poor? Can they sack him from the office? Oh, glory to God. If those things can't happen to you, it can't happen to him, it can't happen to you. Glory to God. This is a mentality to imbibe, a consciousness to have. So how do we respond? Glory to God. Very quickly, how do we respond? We respond by loving others and having fellowship. First John chapter 1 verse 17. They can put it on the screen but I'm not going to go into it. We need to have fellowship with others. You see many people come to church and you want to do solo Christianity. You don't want anybody to know you. You don't want to talk to anybody. You just want to come in. When Pastor Balaji says, okay, look to your neighbor and say hello. <laughs> look to your neighbor and say hello. You're like, you put up a wall and you think that that's Christianity. The Bible says that's not Christianity. That's not fellowship. And you're saying, I have a reason. I have a good reason. I don't want anybody to talk to me anyhow, to offend me. I have news for you. Offense is part of Christianity. How can you love without forgiveness? He said it very clearly. He said anybody can love his friend. But the true love is the person that can love his enemy. And the people in church are not really your enemy. They're just offending you. What's the offense? Sit down here. I can't sit down here. Thou shalt is very annoying. That's it. Praise the name of the Lord. Glory to God. I don't have, I have offense stories. <laughs> oh, I don't have time. But I'll give you gist. Glory to God. I have confessed the love of God in me. It's at work in me. I'll be crying in tears. I'll be walking on the express. The love of God is that. Because somebody had done something. I remember one lady. She shouted at me in public. I didn't do anything. I just said, how are you? Get out! Get out! I don't, I, I don't even know what's wrong with her. She sh ah, embarrassed me in University of Lagos. You can imagine. But God wanted to test me, not her. One day we were having a conference and she, the, the bathrooms were locked and the key, she was told that the key was with me. But the key was not really with me. So she came to me. The same girl, a few weeks later, that stopped, even stopped talking to me completely. I was like, hey, call me. I heard that the key to the toilet is, is with you. You know what I could have done? I don't know where it is. It, was, it would have been a good time to, get my, get, to come back at her. But the love of God constrained me. Even though the key was not with me, I went and I looked for the key. And I opened the bathroom for her. It may seem small, but... See, after I did that, it was as if the Spirit of God just burst out in me that you are a son, you are a child of God. Glory to God. That is why you need people to offend you so you practice your love. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. So you must show love. Number, number two is that you must embrace a life of service. Serve in the house of God. I told the story in the first service. I said, there was one service, I came downstairs and I saw three cars. Coincidentally, one of the cars happened to be Pastor Balaji's car. And I, I was wearing suits. I just took off my suit, rolled my, um, my trousers, removed the shoe, took a sponge, took water, took soap. And I went and I washed the cars. Ah, and it, I was washing just towards the end of service. So people said, coming down. And people were just looking at me. Is that his job? Is, he, is that what he does for a living, washman? 
Does he wash cars? My friends understood what I was doing, but they couldn't partake. He said, don't worry, we'll fetch water for you, but we'll stand very far. We don't know if we can do this. But as I was washing, I remember the scripture that says, anything you do for the least of my brethren, it says you are doing it for me. That's what came to my heart. My heart. If you give water, this cup of cold water, to the least of my brethren, it says that same thing is for me. What would Jesus say about you? Because he's taking notes. He's writing it down. He's seen the ushers. He's seen the traffic guy. He's seen the pastors. He's seen everybody doing everything. And as they are doing it, he's taking note of what they are doing. Because whatever they do for the least of the brethren is directly, praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Okay. Is what you are doing to Jesus directly? Praise him. Can you hear me? Okay. Is what you are doing to Jesus directly. So you need to serve in church so that you can have things that the Lord will say about you. Praise the name of the Lord. Lastly, 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 if you're going to respond to God's love, you're going to accept his love. Let me just illustrate that by saying, married people will understand this. Imagine a married man or a married woman. You, your spouse's birthday is coming up. You now think you want to give him or her one of the best and extravagant birthdays that they have, they have ever experienced. You start your research five months before time. You go, interview sisters, brothers, try and get what he would like. Who should you call from, for, from the US? Who should you call from the UK? What kind of gift? You are putting money together, getting somebody to plan. You plan one of the, and the time comes, you plan one of the most e- extravagant and flamboyant birthday gifts for your spouse. And as you present it with everybody there, expecting his mind to be blown away or her mind to be blown away, and the guy just goes there and says, now this one we go chop. I beg. And walks away. How would you feel? Devastated, disappointed. Some people can even get into depression. That's how Jesus feels after he has shown us so much extravagant love and we reject his love. And some of us are here, and I can tell you there are major, two major reasons why people have not really accepted Jesus. They come to church, but they don't know him. Two major reasons. Number one, is the fact that they are skeptical. How are we so sure that this thing is real? How are we so sure it's not a hoax? Then all of a sudden, they now say that, okay, I'll just be coming to church, but I'm not really into this thing. But just, let's just reason together. Let's assume that it's not real. Let's assume that it's a hoax. And you just go along with it and believe. And by the time, because what thing is inevitable? Death. All of us will face what is on the other side. Right? Nobody's going to escape that. So when we get there, I now realize that, hey, God is real, oh. At least you are safe because you are in him. But imagine you get there and you are not in him. There's nothing you can do. You have nothing to lose to accept the Lord. But you have everything to lose to reject him. Why don't you just use logic and say, I will accept him. It's like somebody that is going somewhere and they say, you need this document. You need this document to pass through the um, immigration. Whether you know, you don't know. You just say, let me take it. Because if I get there and I don't need it, you will pass. But if you get there, you didn't carry it and you need it you stay. That's how it is with salvation. Number two is that some people will say, oh, I need to enjoy this life. You know, I don't want anybody to clip my wings. I need to do all these things. I know a lady that said that, see, I I, I want to enjoy my life. I can't accept Jesus. Another lady, they said, if Jesus can take away fornication from your life, what will you do? She said, ah, Jesu Nifete. He said, Jesus Christ should not not even dare take away fornication. What she does not understand is that sex was created by God. Sex was no man's idea. Money, whatever you are holding on to, was created by God. At least the concept of it. Think about it. The Bible says, the heavens and the heavens were his, are his. But the earth he has given to the sons of man and everything in it. So all the things you are hanging on to, he has already given, in, given it to you. So what are you doing now? You are rejecting the creator for the created. What he created for you, you have rejected him for it. It's like a billionaire wants to help you, has a conversation with you, and says, okay, let's quickly go. Just take this 10K. I'm coming. I'm coming. And you just say, ah, he dropped 10K. Ah, oh, I'm going to take the cap. You now run. The guy now comes back with a check. And I says, where's the person I want to help? Where's the person I want to help? He said, he ran away with the 10,000 10, naira. And I said, this is $10 million for her. <laughs> Praise the name of the Lord. That's what we do when we reject his love. I hope with these few words of mine, I've been able to convince you. 
will not confuse you that Jesus is Lord. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. All right, if you are here, you are in this auditorium, you haven't accepted Jesus, you haven't accepted his love, today is your day. Now is the hour of salvation. Don't postpone it to another day. I just want you to do something very quick with me so that we can rejoice together. I want you to lift up your hand clearly above your head so that we can recognize you. You haven't accepted Jesus or you are confused about what it means. Just lift up your hand above your head. Let's settle it today. Don't leave it to tomorrow. Thank you, my brother over there. Any other person all across the hall, people are raising up their hands. Thank you. You say, oh, thank you, my sister. There's somebody else again over there. If you are there, oh, thank you, my brother. There's somebody else over there. Keep, please keep your hands lifted up because the ushers will give you a card. You're going to say a simple prayer with me because I'm out of time. But we have to do this. Can you just put your hand on your chest and say, Father, I thank you. I thank you because you died for me. I receive your sacrifice. I believe that you died for me, for my sins. I receive your life into my life. I believe, I, I believe with my heart and confess with my mouth that you are Lord over my life. Thank you, Heavenly Father. I'm a new man in Christ. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. Glory be to God. Can we welcome Pastor Bolaji on stage? We can do better than that. Glory to God. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Can we all stand and shout a big hallelujah? No, that's weak. Can we shout a big hallelujah? Can we shout a louder hallelujah? Amen. Please, you can have your seat. Praise God. Amen. 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 Pastor, can we preach so powerfully? I don't even know if there's a need to. I don't even know if there's a need to add anything to what he has said, because this is a fourth service, and in the fourth service, what we'll focus is that we have all of this. Um, we have all of this very special area of our lives that we love to bring the word of God into. Maybe we can move it to next week. What do you think? Okay, this is what I will do, just to make sure that... The reason why I'm, I'm very careful that some of you invited someone specifically for the series. So that's the only reason why I'm going to do it. For, so for 10, 15 minutes, I will just pull a little and we'll close, you know, we'll just close from there. I'm going to start by reading. So I'm going to continue from what part of committee teach is very directed to the issue of overcoming self-doubt and um, low self-esteem. The reason why is this. This is the reason why. If you focus on how much God loves you, it will dissolve your self-doubt. If you focus on how much God loves you, self-doubt comes from a place where you are not conscious of God's love. Because the nature of love itself is that it fills your heart with assurance. And let me tell you something. Jesus is wonderful. Ever look at me. Ever look at me. When Peter was denying him three times, this will be on Thursday. You know, some people say Jesus was crucified. Jesus was not crucified on Friday. He was crucified on Thursday. Someone say how? Because the Bible says he must spend three nights and three days. So, in that to die, Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, then resurrect on Sunday morning. Yeah. So that just by the way, but when when Peter denied him on Thursday night. One, two, three times. When it was a third time with a third crow, who looked at Peter? When he looked at him, was it look like? It was not a look of. It was a look of. I forgive you. That was why, as soon as Peter heard that, he rushed to ask for forgiveness. What happened to Judas Iscariot? There was nobody to tell him. I love you. He committed suicide. Because, because the love of God has the power in you. And I'm saying it to you because all of you here, we could talk about a lot of ways to overcome yourself doubt. But the more you focus on how much God loves you, the more you focus on how much God loves you, it will fill your heart with assurance. So get what the trick of the devil is. The trick of the devil is always to make you doubt God's love for you. And I always say this. I said, one of the most dangerous places you can be in your Christian life 
is to ever be in the place where you think or you doubt God's love for you. If you are in a place in your Christian life where you doubt God's love for you, where you think God doesn't love you, you are in a terrible place as a matter of fact, you are under spiritual attacks. Because if the devil wants to destroy you, the first thing he attacks, and what is a spiritual attack? People don't understand spiritual attack. They think it's some arrows coming from somewhere. Spiritual attack comes in your thoughts. Satan puts a thought in your mind that God doesn't love you. God doesn't care about you. And the more you buy that, the more you see manifest in your life. Let me show you a scripture. Turn your Bible to 2 Corinthians. Glory to God. 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. Glory to God. 2 Corinthians. Chapter 11, verse 3. 2 Corinthians, chapter 11, verse 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 in verse 3. So what does it say? It says, I fear by what? Come on. What, why are you behaving like that this evening? This afternoon. I fear by what? Do you hear any means? It can be a broken relationship. It can be a failed marriage. It can be your upbringing, your mom, your dad. It can come through any means. Somebody say any means. It says, I fear by any means as Satan beguiled. The word beguiled there is seduce. He seduced Eve through his subtlety. So we're going to look at what Satan did to Eve. It says, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Can you give me maybe the passion translation of this verse? The passion translation or the message translation. Anyone that is easier for you. Glory to God. See what the Bible says. He says, I am afraid that just as Eve was deceived by Satan's clever thoughts, clever lies, that your thought, did you see that? So the point is that the lies corrupt what? The thoughts. So let me tell you how people don't know their thoughts are under attack. Because when Satan wants to attack people, you think Satan will say that. Satan will come and say, I'm tempting you, eat this bread. I'm tempting you, do this. No, that's not temptation. When temptation comes, it will come in your words. I feel like. But that feeling is a suggestion of Satan. He says this. He said, I'm afraid that Satan, as Eve was deceived by Satan's level eyes, that your thoughts be corrupted. Question. What did Satan tempt Eve with? The same thing he tempted Jesus Christ with. Genesis chapter 2. What did he say? He says that this is what he told Eve. He told Eve that it's this fruit. If you want to be like what? The question is, what was it like before? What was it like before? So what he did, let me tell you a thing. Eating the fruit was not the problem. It was the fact that she bought the lie. She bought the self-doubt. What is self-doubt? To doubt what exactly you are. Eve doubted exactly who she was. She was already like God. Satan says, do this to become like God. And this is the number one temptation of, the, of, the, of Satan. How do I know? It's not the same thing with Jesus Christ. He looked at Jesus Christ and says, he could have told Jesus Christ, turn this bread, stone to bread. Maybe he would have done it. But you know what he said? It says, if you are the, it says, if you are the son of God. All the temptation was, if you are the son of God. What was he trying to do? He was trying to put self-doubt in Jesus. So, when he says, if you are the son of God, do this. So, it was almost as if I have to perform to become the son of God. So, Jesus Christ said, you don't understand, Satan. Man shall not live by bread alone by every word that proceeds out the word of God. What was he saying? He says, I don't have to perform to solve my self-doubt. I believe the word because man shall not live by bread alone, but by the word of the Lord. I believe the word. Ever look at me. Look at me. Everybody that struggles with self-doubt that wants to overcome it, if you change what you say, you will change your life. Everyone that struggles with self-doubt, if you just change what you say, you will change your life. Let me, let me, let me, let's do an example. Where's my microphone? Tell me, anybody that, anybody that is here that struggles with self-doubt, tell me what you say often. Yeah, tell me what you say often. Tell me what you say to yourself. When you're in that mood where you have self-doubt and low self-confidence, tell me what you tell yourself. Ends up quickly. Ends up quickly. 
Yes, go ahead. What do you say? I will say I'm on top and not beneath. No, no, no. What do you tell yourself okay. in the negative states? I That's can it. never lose. No, that is that. in the positive states. Okay. When you feel down and you are in the negative states, okay. what do you say? When I'm in the negative states, state, like yes, now, what? if I'm sick, I say I'm, I'm by the strike of Jesus, I am healed. Okay, thank you. Good. She didn't get my question, but it's okay. Yeah, we'll keep going. Yeah. Yeah. You can have your seat. There's someone, there's someone, we need two microphones so to make it faster for all of us. Yeah, there's someone, yeah. What do you say here? Yeah. So every time I tell myself, every time I'm in self doubt, I tell myself I'm not qualified. You tell yourself what? I'm not qualified. Yeah. How do you say it? Tell, use the tone you used to say it. So um, I think in terms of career, when I'm trying to apply to like jobs that are like really like high paying jobs. You know, you know you're talking to me. Yes. But that's not the tone that comes to your mind that you're not qualified. What tone? Is it a harsh tone? Is it penetrating tone? What, it's just what? a very funny. Ah, you're not qualified. Do you see that? It's a tone of exhaustion. That, oh, you know you you know you will fail again. Oh, they won't pick you. Or what? They, they won't even look at your CV. They will not look at your CV. It, it's a very suggestive tone. It's not even the it's not even the tone that you want to discuss with. That's good. Please go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, so oftentimes when I'm in self-doubt, I often always get very scared of being judged. So what, what do you say? What, what, what do you hear in your mind and what is said? What, what do you hear in your mind? Sometimes you vocalize it. Sometimes you hear it. Yeah, yeah. Like, it's always coming to me like I'm not good enough. You're not good enough? Yeah, like when I do this thing, like people are going to look like... So, 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 so you, see, I want to show you something. When people are in self-doubt there is that consistent conversation they have with themselves that amplifies their negative states. We're struggling with self-doubt currently and it's really bad. You, tell me a story. Yeah? Come, come to the front first. I want this lady, yeah, this lady in front first. Tell, tell me what, where you're struggling. Not over here, just in front of you. Yeah, yeah. Look at her. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, why are you self doubt there? Um, I just feel um, God don't love me. So tell me what led to this. I'm a prayerful person. I yeah. pray. I lost my my mom a few days ago. And You lost your mom a few days ago. Yeah. Okay. And I feel like why am I praying? God don't love me. That God doesn't love you. Yeah. Wow. So why, why do you feel that God doesn't love you? So many wrong things are happening in my life. Give me top three. Financial breakthrough. I'm struggling. You're struggling what? Financially. Financially. One. I'm a single mom. You're a single mom too. No help. There's no help. What about there's no help? I have people I, that are my friends. Yeah. And when I call to talk about something like Alpha, this is what I'm going through. Can you come through for me? When I know you can, nobody comes through for me. Nobody comes to show you. So you're saying that in your entire life, nobody has ever come through for you before? My dad. Your dad. So in the last one and a half years, there's nobody that's helped you before. Think about it. <laughs> there has been one or two people that have sent you money, yes or no? True. True. So how can you say nobody helps you? Situation at that time, the, the reason just the thought just just comes in. I, I will tell you why the thought comes in. I, I'm going to come to woman. The reason why the thought comes in is this, because at that time, this is why you feel negative. You choose to focus on the negative. So, for example, think about it. Three people have helped in the last one year. Yes or no? True. 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 Mention their names in your mind. Don't mention the names on the mic microphone. Mention their names in your mind. How do you feel? Remembering that. Use the microphone. Use the microphone. How do you feel? Remember that these people helped me. Good. Good. The reason why you feel good is because you choose to focus. And I tell you something. What we've not learned over time is that we don't we we have not trained to know you can choose what you focus on emotionally or with your thoughts. 
And the Bible is the first person that teaches us that. He says, set your affection. Your affection means your emotions. He said that, the Bible says in, in, in this way, it says, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things of good report, he said, think of these things. He tells you what to think on and what not to what think on. So the reason why you feel God doesn't love you is because nobody helps. But from today, we see that that's not really true. People help you sometimes and they don't help you what sometimes. Yes or no? True. True. Is that a normal human experience or that's an abnormal human experience? Use the microphone. Normal human experience. Is that a problem? No, it's not. No. Even me that I'm your pastor, there are times that people help me. There are times that people don't help. But if I want to become sad, I will just focus on all the people that are not helping me. Then I'll become very sad. And if I want to become very happy, I'll focus on what all the people that are helping me and I'll become very happy. So the second thing is that, so you lost, um, so that's the first thing. So the second thing, you're, you're a single mom. And as a single mom, is it all negative? No. So why did you say so? What's the problem? <sighs> Do you know why it's not all negative? Because the moment I say, as a single mom, is it all negative? You look towards your side. And there's a handsome young boy there. <laughs> What's his name? What? Miracle. Oh my God. Miracle come. Miracle come. Come, come. Miracle come. Miracle, how are you? Give me a hug. Come on, give me a hug. Mm. You are a miracle. Your mommy is over there. She loves you. You know that, right? You have the best mommy in the world, right? Do you love your mommy? Tell me, do you love your mommy? Yes. She said, I love my mommy. And the reason why I said that is that when you say that you're a single mom and that's your second biggest problem, is this your second biggest problem? This is your biggest joy. The theme is that you need to focus. Let's take a picture of me and Miracle. Miracle high five. Yeah. Praise God. Help me hold Miracle back to his seat. I hope you know your son is very handsome. Hold on. Let me ask you a question. How many of you would love to have a guy as, like that? Oh, keep your hands up. Keep your hands up. Lady, look around. This is your second biggest problem. And everybody here is praying for it. Listen to me. I've said this. I'll say this again. The life you have is not what you experience. It's what you focus on. Are there challenges with raising him? Of course. But look at, look at how your boy just brought us joy. Pastor, come preach. He could never get us to do this in 30 minutes. I've been talking for 10 minutes now. I've never done, but the miracle come. We all experience a miracle. Some of the women were crying. How many women were crying? Just so many. Look at them. They were just all crying and tears. You know the thing? The more you begin to tell yourself that, Lord, this is the blessing of this the more you will see more blessing come out of it I'm not saying it's not challenging I'm, you know some people believe in um, what they call it positive um, no 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 that's what I'm saying there's a, there's a positive thinking I don't believe in positive thinking the way they say it because positive thinking can get into trouble 
because positive thinking is positive action. Uh -huh. Positive thinking also sometimes makes people deny what is happening. That's what I preach. I'm saying that there are real problems, but think about it differently. So the first one is financial. Good. So if finance is the first problem, which is the first thing you said, look, let me always tell you something. Everybody look at me. When you go through a problem, the question you, so what is the financial problem? Tell me. Tell me. Tell me. Describe it to me. I can't do this. I can't do that. Maybe one thing you can't do because of finances. I find it difficult to do this. You don't have to be explicit. You, and this is, yeah, I understand. What do you have? In terms of my career. In terms of your career. You can pursue your career because of your finances, right? Yeah, somehow. Because I feel my career is... Um, you have to be some kind of way to, to achieve some things in okay, your career. Okay, so, so you need some kind of finance to fund your career. Yeah. Good. So let me ask another question. So what is this teaching you? What are you learning about money from this face? You don't know. That's fine. How is it limiting you? Use the microphone, yeah. Self-doubt. What? Self-doubt. Yeah, but in a practical way, how is this limiting you? One, two, three, four, five. In practical ways, how is this limiting you? The funding, how is it limiting you? Yeah. Um, fees, rent, and all Did of that. Did you see that? When I say how is limiting her, she had a lot of things to say. When I said, what is it teaching her? She doesn't have anything to say. The reason why is this. You're focusing on how it's limiting you not what you're learning and for you to come out of it you have to think about what you're learning to come out of it so my sister let me tell you something one thing will change your life change your focus one thing will change your life change your focus in the three examples you gave all i just saw that you were focused on the negative change your focus so why do you have self-doubt Because you mentioned self-doubt. Why do you have self-doubt? Yeah. Because I feel I've helped people. I've, you not, have always, I've not always been like this. So I've what's always, the cause of your self-doubt? Like no one's going to help me. Like I can't do it. You can't do it. So why can't you do it? I think it's just my mindset. Where, where did it come from? Where did it start? Firstly, Were you born that way? No, I wasn't. He said when you were in university, secondary school, business, when you had the baby? No, when I lost my dad. When you lost your dad. That's why you felt as if you, you couldn't do it. Why was that ta attached to your dad? The reason I want to show you is that self-doubt has a beginning. That's what I'm going to. The, the, the guy I spoke to last week, I don't know if you remember the story. He told you about when his teacher started talking to him in a certain way. And the reason why is that I also had a secondary school teacher that said some things to me and it affected me in a certain way. Yeah, I'm able to share those stories now because, because of how big the platform is. Some of these stories go back to them and they don't understand that I'm just sharing my story to help people. They think that maybe I'm attacking them, which, you know, I've healed, I'm healing through the process and makes no difference to me, actually. You know, so your dad was a very big support for you. Yeah. Use the microphone. What did he used to do? Yeah, tell me. My dad is the only one who calls me in the morning and says, Mary, how are you doing? My dad is the only one who, ah, dad, this is not happening right now. I need support in this area, and he comes through for me. Is that good or bad? Good. What? Good. Should I be honest with you? Mm -hmm. It's good and bad. All of us are parents, you can love your children so much, you protect them from the real world. You're setting them up for failure. I'm telling the truth. Some of you love your children so much. You're protecting them from the real world. And that's why all of these things about don't give people grades in school, everybody has passed, everybody is a success. You know this new thing going on in schools? It's all rubbish. Because in the real world, people win and people lose. And every child must know what it feels like winning what it feels like losing and what to do when you win and what to do when you lose. So we have people that when they enter the real world, they are, when they lose, they don't know what to do. 
Can I be honest with you? Ladies that are very close to their fathers always have marital problems. It's in a, in a funny way. And you know why they have mental problems? Because most of the time, they expect their father from their husband. I'm telling you, they expect their father from their husband. Then number two, they always forget that their father, they were their father's daughter, not their father's wife. So when they come into a marriage, they want to be treated as that favorite daughter of their husband. Many of you know what I'm talking about, yes or no? Yeah. So they come into the marriage. In the marriage, they're wondering, why are you not treating me like my dad? And we're like, see, ladies that are close to your father, if you want to get a good balance, think of how your father treats your mom. That's how you should be treated. Most of those ladies that are close to their father, they even know their father's girlfriend. They will cover her from their mother. So my, my sister, let me help. I think your dad was a great guy. And I think he had the best intention for you. But I think in trying to support you, he also shielded you from life. And now that life is happening to you, you are shocked. Like, why is it happening that way? There's nothing wrong with you. It's just life. Financial challenges, just life. The reason why is that once you know that, then you know that if this is just life, then I know how to what approach it you know i was talking to one lady was talking to some weeks ago and she was like three or four people said they don't want to help me i said that how many people do you have to talk to to get help you have to talk to quite a number it's good for us to be this number in church but do you know for a long time in our services we're just six people we're just six people so I think you're in a good part. I, I love the fact that you're speaking up. I think that your son miracle is a big blessing. Yeah, I think you should put, I think you should put him on some modeling jobs. Let him put it as a baby. Yeah, the guy has style, you know. But I think for you, I think for you, it's just to begin to change. It's, it's what I call mental templates. I'll give an example. Just like some of you, the way you are when you date, your boyfriend must give you money every month. Some of you are like that, yes or no? Some people are like that, you know. Some, of, some people are like that. So when they date, you expect like pocket money from your boyfriend every month. Yeah, you know. Yeah, some people are like, what's that? You know, that, that's rubbish. But, some like, but the key thing, I'm not even saying if it's right or wrong. What it, the problem is, is your mental, is a template in your mind. So when the boyfriend don't give you money every month, you say it's stingy. Not because it's stingy, because your template says it should do this. The problem is this. Look at me. I'm not here to address if it's right or wrong. This is not relationship class. What I'm here to address is that once your template is wrong, you will have problems. So, for example, some template says once we date, we must be having sex without question. Is it not true? So, if you date someone like that and you say, I'm born again, say, eh, and what? Me too, I'm born again now. Just come, let's do it. So, the question is not either you're born again or not. It's a template problem. So, sometimes what you want to change is the template you have in your mind. I mean, one guy spoke here and he said because he was a Christian, he said he was going to sleep with his girlfriend. And they did it for one and a half years or two years. And he just found that last one that his girlfriend was pregnant. And they've not been having sex. And he didn't know that sex was so important to her that she was getting somewhere else. But the reason why the girl could not talk was because they were meant to be so-called born again. So, that was the standard template. And instead of that to say that my template does not allow this, the way I'm trained, I need to have sex. And for them to restructure that template, she kept quiet and looked for an escape and she got into trouble. Praise God. So what are you going to do? Focus on miracle. Focus on the beautiful things that have happened. And you're going to have a beautiful life. Amen. Praise God. So, hold on. Give her back the microphone. I've not, I've not dealt with something. So, you say your self-doubt started when your father died. Yeah. What did your father's death mean to you? Watch, listen, everybody. What did it mean to you? Like, my life came crushing. Did you hear that? Is that true? No. Why do you believe that? Because I 
things happen, other events came up. Yeah. If your father, if you could see your father right now on this stage, and you tell him that, what will he tell you? Focus on you. You know the point. The point is that something happened to you big in your life. Your father died. And you gave it a meaning. I never said that. So you gave it a meaning. So you'll be surprised that in your family, your father's death did not affect everybody equally. It affected you more. Yes or no? Yeah, because I'm carrying my family on my shoulder. Yeah, what? I'm carrying my family on my shoulder. You're carrying your family on your shoulder. But that's, I understand that. But it still didn't affect everybody equally. Yeah. The reason why is that because every person gave different meaning to it. So for you, the meaning you gave to your father's death was this. What was the meaning? The meaning you gave. Don't worry, it's okay, it's doing well. The meaning you gave to your father. You know, the meaning you gave to your... I mean, look at that miracle, just like touching you like... You know, like, you know so the meaning, the meaning you gave to your father's death was this. That my life is over. I have no helper. Life is crushing me. What do you experience? You experience those very things. I said to your dad. Then you must remember that this boy is your son, not your husband or boyfriend. So don't raise him up that way. Next time you come, you take him to the children's church. Yeah. So that you can... Because another thing is that you're a single mom, you want to get married. You can put all your emotion into your child and now have other place for someone to love you. And you will not even be conscious of it. Yeah, because all the way he's touching you, he learned it from you. He was not born that way now, he learned it from you. Praise God. Praise God. I say hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Is this helpful? Let me tell you something about your father's death. When my father died, that was the time I became a woman and I began to make things happen for myself. That is an empowering narrative. Not that when my father died, that's when my life was crushed. I've lost my both parents. When my mom died, I just told myself, I'm a full adult. That's what I told. That, that was the meaning to me. To somebody else, it meant my world was over. It meant I'm alone in this world. I just told myself, I'm a full adult. In fact, sometimes I talk to my wife, my wife's parents are alive, and I said, you know you have parents. I cannot live like someone that has parents. If I live recklessly, nobody's coming to look for me. I said, you now your dad and your mom will just show up. So, I let that experience empower me, not become what? A disadvantage to me. So, let your father's death empower you. Now, you lost your mom. Do you feel more empowered or you feel more broken? More broken. More broken. So, what does your mom's death mean to you now? You've lost both of them. Often, I'm an orphan. What? I'm an orphan. You're an orphan? Yeah. Yeah. What does that mean? That's the negative of saying the positive thing. Why now? Why now? When my mom died, I'm like, why now? Okay, you, you know, I don't know too much. Yeah. But the good thing about being an orphan is that you're respons- you can be responsible. So why not choose the responsible part? Why not choose the fact that I'm an orphan? You'll never hear me say I'm an orphan. I just say my parents are dead. Because it often comes along with helplessness. Yes, but I want to take the part of responsibility. You know, that kind of thing. There's grace for you. Is that okay? How do you feel? I feel good. Praise Thank God. Yeah, amen. Praise the Lord. Let's close, let's close, let's close, let's close, let's close. So, one scripture I want to read to you. Um, Genesis 49, verse 3 to 4. We'll continue next week. Verse 3 to 4. This is the reason why you need to overcome self-doubt. This is the reason why you need to overcome self that Genesis, Genesis, okay, if you want to tweet about these experiences, you know, this is something to tweet about, go ahead and tweet about it on Twitter. Genesis, yeah, you can tweet about it right now. Genesis chapter 49, verse 3 to 4. Chapter 49, verse 3 to 4. Genesis 49, verse 3 to 4. Self-doubt. So who else is struggling with self-doubt? Any other person? You are? I want, I want this guy to talk, yeah. There's this guy in front here. Do you have a microphone for him? I don't know what microphone guys they're sleeping today. Yeah. 
Yeah. Good afternoon, Chad. Good afternoon. What's your name? Elvis. Elvis. Can I can you take off your glasses? Is that okay? Okay. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> the thing about self doubt for me, it's it's time consuming. So tell me your experience with that. What, 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 yeah. Time consuming and procrastination. Yeah. So tell me what, tell me so a story. Yeah. Whenever I want to do something that is right, and then I come to think about. So what did you want to do that was right? That you, so no, that Okay, for example, let's say. Don't say for example. Tell me okay, a story. For business. Yeah. I have a project I want to walk into and talk to them about my product. Okay. And then something comes and tells me like that feeling, that self-doubt, like you, you don't have the capacity to do this and job. And have you done it right now? Have you done it or you've not done it? I have done it. You've done it? Yes. How did you overcome the self-doubt? Because... How did you overcome it? Yeah. How I overcome it? Because I looked at the past and how I had... Um, okay, for example, one incident that happened. Just right opposite my house, there was a project that was going on. I kept passing that building and I, I was telling myself, man, I can't go, this, this is a very big project, I can't step in, I can't tell them about my product and stuff. And I, I was doubting myself, like, even if they give you this job, are you sure you can even, you have the capacity to oh, do this Hold on, I want to see, I want to see the power of self-doubt. Number one, self-doubt limits how far you can dream. You will just find that you can dream far. What's the second thing, sir? So, um, after a while, because I said it's time consuming, I, I kept... So, did you eventually do that project opposite your house? Did you step into it or you never... Could yes, I stepped in. But you when stepped I stepped in, it was already late. So it was already had, late. Had Do you see, self-doubt makes you lose opportunities. Let's read, and because I want us to close, I don't want us to go beyond now. Yeah, I would love to take the story. See what it says. Everyone look at... race together. Ruben, you are my firstborn. My might... The beginning of what? My strength. The what? The excellency of dignity. And what? Excellency of power. Continue verse 4. Next verse, please. Unstable. Did you see where the self that comes in? It says, unstable as water, thou shalt not what? Excel. Did you see what the self that? He didn't say they didn't have potential. He said the excellency of dignity and the excellency of what? Of power. But because you're unstable, because that's what self-doubt does. Self-doubt makes you unstable. It says you eventually will not excel. So the reason why some of you find that you cannot fully pursue something, you procrastinate, you are halfway in and halfway out, is because at the root of it, there's a self-doubt there. You know, can I be honest with you? Many of you that are single here have self-doubt that you get married. You have self doubt, you get married. As a matter of fact, when someone approaches you, all this marriage thing, I'm never even sure it's for me. You know what the Bible says? It says, if you think like that, unstable as water, you will not excel. And that's why in this series, we're talking about how to overcome self doubt. And you have to track it. Where did this start from? In what area does it happen? Because you don't have self doubt in everything. Sometimes it's in specific areas that this happens. So maybe what you want to do between now and next week is this. Will you write where yourself, what area you started from? And also write for yourself. What do you want to write for yourself? Write specific things. This what area and when did it start? When did it start? When did it start? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Okay, let's pray.